Okay, good afternoon all. Um, welcome to this afternoon's session uh, on Europe's Earth Observation Sentinels, New Opportunities for Ecology. Uh, just a minute of introduction uh, about the session itself and our motivations and where it comes from. Um, we formed uh, uh, a network, a research network, uh, in the Northwest called the Northwest Earth Observation Network. It's at the foot of the, the header here, uh, about a year ago, with a, an interest in uh, providing an opportunity for uh, discussion and collaboration uh, about Earth observation, especially in relation to ecological and environmental analysis, which tends to be our, the interests of the, uh, the central interests of the main protagonists. The member organisations of NEON are shown at the bottom. It's a series of universities and academic institutions and research organisations. We have CEH and so on, uh, based in Lancaster uh, here as well. Uh, and one of our big activities is this session and the accompanying evening event uh, to go along with it. Um, so I'm very pleased to be at the British uh, Ecological Society meeting and to uh, be, have our thematic se uh, session accepted uh, by them. So the sponsors for today's activities are listed at the top here. Uh, BES is obviously central to this, as is the Remote Sensing and Photogrammetry Society, uh, the logo in the top right. And then our three financial sponsors are Environment Systems, Specto Natura and Sterling Geo. And each of uh, these organisations will be represented at some point today, either uh, in the session this afternoon or this evening. So we have a great session lined up. We're very excited about the, the content we've managed to bring together to, to showcase new developments with the, the Sentinel remote sensing uh, mission. But we also have a, a, a bonus feature, and you'll see uh, center, central to the slide the uh, RSP, so the Remote Sensing Photogrammetry Society annual lecture and conversazioni, which is being held, um, helpfully supported by uh, BES, here this evening in this same auditorium at seven o'clock. And we have uh, an old experienced hand in conservation remote sensing, Dr. Natalie Petarelli from the Zoological Society of London uh, giving that lecture. That will be followed by a drinks reception in room A4. For those of you uh, still standing after the, the poster session and drinks reception that goes on then, we're just trying to continue things uh, and keep you happy all evening. So you are very warmly invited uh, to come back for this showcase lecture this evening. It, it, should be very good. Um, in the meantime, then, we'll kick off with our plenary speaker in this afternoon's session, so on uh, the Sentinels themselves. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, a leading practitioner from Europe uh, here today, Dr. Gebhard Banko from Environment Agency Austria, uh, has come to tell us about uh, the land information system there, which is driven by Sentinel data. Gebhard is deputy lead of the Nature Conservation Department uh, at Environment Agency Austria, and I'll let you introduce the rest. Thank you, Paul, for your nice words. Always when I'm invited to any conference, uh, I don't know if I'm invited because of my background. I, I studied forestry, so I have at least a bit of ecological uh, background, but years ago, so I have no clue on ecology anymore. And sometimes I talk of remote sensing, but I'm not a remote sensing expert. So maybe this is sometimes, uh, I don't know about the audience, maybe some are half of it are ecologists, half of remote sensing experts. So let's see if we can meet here. Um, Sentinel-2. So I thought, uh, I mean, I had seven years of Latin in school, and I don't know if it was a waste of time or not, but then I thought for uh, Ovid said this, uh, the golden age will come now. And so it's really the hope <laughs> of many that Sentinel will bring us uh, together ecology and remote sensing, or will it be the old story? We have a great satellite, we have great images, so everything will be uh, promised, but uh, can we really fulfill from the remote sensing perspective uh, what they are um, promising? My main issue within this talk is really this uh, change over time, this transformation. Until now, when we dealt in remote sensing with changes, they were really like state changes between two distinctive land cover classes. And now it's really time to bridge over. Uh, I will talk of different types of changes, and maybe Sentinel will be 
a nice tool to bridge this gap and to come uh, closer to habitats uh, on this level. I don't talk too much on Sentinel-2, just to give you the key features for, for those that are not yet so familiar, um, especially in the comparison with Landsat 7 and 8. The main issue will be a higher temporal resolution. So beside this higher spatial resolution, where we talk of 10 meters in most of the bands, this will mean in the end, if I say in the end, Currently, we are only dealing with the first Sentinel, Sentinel-2A, which has been launched uh, last year in 2017. This should be the second Sentinel. And then we think, at least in Austria, with 30 measurements throughout the vegetation period. And 30 measurements is really something that we did not have until now. If you think of the times where you had to buy a Lancet scene, it was like 5,000 euro for one scene. So you studied half a year to get the best scene and, and then you spend your money on one scene. And I thought, okay, w what can we get out of these images? Um, this is one special part in, in Austria uh, where a farmer has two different fields. And the question is, do you really see a land cover change here? So this is a normal wheat field. And we always discuss between these two uh, nomenclature differences, what is land cover and what is land use. So this is a normal agricultural field, so the land use will stay uh, the same. And until now, we also said, okay, the land cover is some kind of arable area, although we don't call it arable area because arable is a land use term. So we really had problems for the land cover, how to deal with these concepts. And on the other side, uh, this is just uh, nearby a wheat field, um, a soya field uh, that is harvested after 15th of September. And we were always interested, okay, how do these uh, temporal timelines look like? And, and this year we had the opportunity together with the farmer to take the in situ uh, photographs so we exactly know when has been taken which measurement type on, on this field. And it was quite nice because the, the wheat field is harvested um, somewhere by uh, July, early July, and the harvest of the soya is by uh, late September. And even with the Sentinel-1, uh, for this ecosystem type, it's very good uh, profile that you can derive. We tested uh, a similar approach for grassland, so we had uh, two grasslands nearby, a one-cut meadow and a, a three-cut meadow. And here we also had a farmer taking the pictures, delivering us his uh, management concepts. And uh, what was interesting, the three-cut meadow, the spectral profile did not uh, really look like a three-cut. Because if you look at this one, you can say, okay, maybe it's a two-cut meadow. I don't know exactly. And this was a problem because we had between May and July uh, no observation for six weeks. And this is exactly the time where the first cut is. So it's uh, uh, until now the Sentinel infrastructure, it's, it's a nice infrastructure, but of course still the, the main challenge is to get enough observations within uh, a sensitive time. Um, if that then we compared it with the cuts, actually you really can see everything just <laughs> except when you have no measurement. Um, similar issue with the, with the one cut grassland. Uh, we, we had um, enough measurements for the one uh, cut grassland, but if you compare the two, they look a bit similar. And if I talk to our remote sensing experts, I mean, having automatic classification on, on these NDVI profiles is quite sensitive because first I say we, we have to discuss it with our ecologists, we have to discuss it with our farmers because we are not yet there to completely um, automatize um, these classifications and descriptions. Uh, this brings me back to our land information system that we were developing now since the last six years. Um, it's based on an object-based land information system so it's not the pixel base, but we have real objects in, in landscape and these objects are derived first of all from a segmentation approach from author photos uh, combined with, the, uh, with object height. So this is our method to derive buildings, trees, um, hedges 
and we would like to enrich these objects. And until now, we had no information on the timely aspect because if you derive it from an author photo, the author photo in Austria, it's a three-year revisiting campaign. So it can be that uh, in parts of these author photos are already four years old. Um, it looks a bit like this, so we resample the author photo to 50 centimeters, which is quite enough for normal land cover. We have uh, the information on object heights, and the object heights are really derived from the aerial image campaign. So it's not a parallel campaign using LIDO data or whatever, no, but we have the object heights directly from a dense image matching algorithm uh, directly from the airborne um, photos. We use a segmentation approach and derive until now our normal land cover uh, classes. The normal land cover classes can be listed and we have um, minimum mapping objects starting from 25 square meters for buildings up to uh, those objects that are uh, within larger areas up to 500 square meters. And this was in the first um, phase of our project. And then we realized it's also important if you talk of objects, I mean, the automatic segmentation algorithms will reveal some artifacts as well. So we uh, go back partly to administrative data where IAX is available. And since uh, last year, the IAX data for Austria is publicly available. Uh, so we take this information as well into consideration. And now why I called it LISA 2.0? Because we want to enrich these um, objects now with temporal information. And here we um, got into these concepts that we are still in this paradigm shift in land cover. Until now, what we did mainly was the state changes. So you have somewhere a forest, a forest is cleared, and you have a more or less urban succession. So you have settlements after the forest. But how can we deal with these cyclic changes like in arable area where you have a bare soil that is plowed then you plant something, then, then you plow it again? Or what about these conditional changes? I mean, the conditional changes are maybe processes, ecological processes taking years or decades of, of years. Uh, so it was important for us to, at least from a concept level, um, to implement these different uh, types. And we had the possibility to um, carry out these um, studies within an ESA finance project because uh, Austria was in the lucky position. We, we are paying a lot of money to ESA and uh, there's a geographic return. So Austria has uh, to get projects back from ESA in the same amount as we are paying uh, our membership fees. And so we had, have uh, the project, which is running until end of next year. Um, I have to say, I'm speaking here, um, representing all the, the different team players here. And um, we are dealing with these state changes, where we derive change alert maps between different years. And for us as a user, it was important to say, if we want to update our very high resolution vector map, then it's quite inefficient if we do the update on 100% of the country area. It's better if you have to focus resources into those areas that have a very high probability of changes. And so our first product will be a change alert map uh, derived from uh, purely Sentinel images and I hope that we get uh, sufficient results to increase the efficiency of the normal um, land cover production. I don't want to go too much in, into details. I mean, this is too less detail for our remote sensing experts. And I don't know, for, for you as an ecologist, you may, maybe you have heard here and there about, about the different methods in remote sensing. Um, the only point I would really like to stress, and this is this major challenge are still clouds and, and uh, cloud shadows. ESA is providing some atmospheric correction tools bound in this Sentinel-2, so Sen2 core toolbox. But what our service provider are telling me, it's simply not yet sufficient because you have to calculate what the satellite measures 
on top of the atmosphere reflectance back to the bottom of atmosphere reflectance and it's not yet ideal so we, we are still dealing with imperfect uh, temporal profiles. The cyclic changes are even for me more interesting from an ecological point of view and here we are concentrating on three uh, cyclic so within a year um, elements. We're concentrating on temporary water bodies, we're concentrating on counting the number of bare soils in agricultural feeds and the count of grasslands. The temporary water bodies are quite interesting because we have these large uh, pancho boats which they egg survive 20 to 30 years in, in the soil and they just need 24 hours for the development and within two weeks they, they are ready with their uh, life cycle. And until now we had no information on these temporary water bodies and the area size can be from 100 square meters up to several hectares. So it is possible and we tried it and, and the results look quite promising on here. Um, what I had in the beginning this for arable areas, um, it's a threshold um, value that we apply according to these uh, temporal profiles and we were able to differentiate different types of um, agricultural fields and it was not the main issue to differentiate different crop types but just to count the length, uh, the bare soil period is, is really a bare soil period so not vegetated because it has consequences for soil organisms for erosion control etc. Um, the last um, element in, in these uh, cyclic changes are the grassland cuts that I've shown in the beginning and it was also quite interesting that uh, with some limitations uh, we could uh, define these grassland cuts as well. The last point is still a quite experimental one. We were dealing with conditional changes and here we are playing around with phenological indicators with NDVI timelines really not within a year but over decades of a year and our service provider if you want, want to take a look have uh, produced using our shiny uh, on this web page it's quite nice because you can select a specific polygon and you get the whole timeline from 2005 to 2015 but the interpretation of this timeline really needs a lot of discussion with local ecologists because uh, seeing this timeline um, on the right hand side uh, in the first thing it, it doesn't mean too much for me so it's really um, only the start of a discussion process what can we really derive which kind of information from this timeline. Um, I think the conditional changes we are also thinking of combining it with a higher even higher temporal resolution so modis or Maybe Dan will be afterwards uh, talking about the whole Sentinel family, so maybe Sentinel-3 as well. But we need to interpret these um, temporal profiles essentially in situ observations as well. Um, and beside the in situ um, observations, we need an integrative data model. So we were the last three, year, three years in an intensive discussion also with, with the European Environment Agency, how to combine national approaches with European approaches, how to come from a classification to an enrichment and characterization of classes. And here we touch in the world of INSPIRE and EAGLE. EAGLE is the European Action Group on Land Monitoring in Europe that had tried to further develop the land cover classification system. Um, and we finally prepared different data models. And uh, the core set of such a data model from our point of view is the description of a specific unit. So, uh, you can take the land cover unit as the uh, geographic extent of an object and we describe it. We describe it using parametric observation. A parametric observation is one individual value for a certain um, date. It can be a rather backscatter, it can be uh, whatever. And then interpreted parametric observation we call land cover components. So within um, a certain object uh, you can have 
uh, different land cover components and everything can be bound to some specific nomenclatures as well. Then I don't want to bother you with this one, it's just if you implement it, you have to think of technical possibilities. So we have a PostScript, PostGIS implementation, we provided something for ArcGIS, because at a certain point you have to practically exchange data and the, the normal ArcGIS shapefile is uh, not the, the right um, issue here anymore. Um, so we really had to step uh, into this modeling world as well. What is very essential to my point of view is this time machine that we um, included with our European colleagues uh, to say a specific land cover component uh, has a valid form and valid to uh, lifetime. So it means, and I come to um, one example, if you have a one idealistic parametric observation, you have specific land cover components within a specific time. So bare soil, then you have herbaceous vegetation, then the field is plowed again. These are land cover components within a year. And throughout the year, we have to name the, this um, unit. And we don't call it arable area or grassland area because arable and grassland are land use terms uh, from our point of view. Um, but we call it herbaceous periodically, which better characterize the land cover characteristic. Um, then I'm coming to the end, and the end is the start for many ecologists because for the interpretation you need uh, robust in situ data. So we accompany our project studies with ecologists in the field doing these vegetation values um, on different sites so that we get uh, the information abundance really on species level, and then we, we can. Um, aggregate this information and uh, combine it with our vegetation um, signal that we receive from the sentinel. But here and there we also do some uh, unmanned aerial vehicle flight campaigns. In the beginning we thought, wow, this is really a cheap uh, possibility to derive in situ data because if you buy really, and I'm talking of the cheap ones or so not the professional ones, it costs you 1,500 euros, so almost nothing. But if you think which working time is really needed to uh, produce a good author photo then for a certain period of, of time, then it ends up also to several thousand euros. So then you see, well, it's limited for, I would say, maybe in maximum 50 hectares, but, but not more. And um, until this area, you can use it. And then we produce author photos with two to three centimeter resolution which is essential to my mind um, is to take really very nice ground control point measurements, especially in nature conservation area. It's not easy because we, we had a field excursion to a bog and admire. I don't have to talk <laughs> to you how difficult it is to walk within a, a bog. Um, but without these, the quality of the author photo is not acceptable uh, for field campaigns. In addition to our experts and, and the uh, author photos, we also want to uh, include uh, the public, tourists, people being out there uh, just uh, for the vacation. So we develop apps under the PhotoQuest Go. It's also a European wide app where we receive stan standardized landscape photos combined with the uh, location. So GPS coordinates are written to the EXIF header of the files. And there is our main partner, it's YASA, contributing to this activity. Um, the last two slides, the, the large scale production of, of LISA is currently in a rollout phase and hopefully we will have the data available by end of 2019. And some useful links for those that have not been accessing Sentinel until now. Um, I personally use a lot the Amazon Web Service to browse for data, to monitor specific areas. If you don't want to download, but, but if you just are interested on a, a certain small area, you can create very nice timelines um, using a special app. And here you have it. And 
I don't hope you have to download data for yourself because if you download it from the ESA portal on a scene base, it's six gigabyte per scene. Uh, then it's better to take these tiles from Amazon Web Service because it's only 700 megabyte. My conclusion is Sentinel Offer is delivering great opportunities. We uh, are trying to work in these three different types of changes. Currently still methodological developments um, are needed and my really feeling is that ecologists should take the lead in the interpretation of these NDVI profiles because otherwise um, a lot of remote sensing experts will come with their random forest classifier and ontology based classifications or whatever but um, my opinion is what now it's still the phase to discuss the, these timelines to have an ecological background and what you cannot see uh, they will not be able to classify with their sophisticated classifiers. Thank you. This is still the last slide. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Mark. I was interested in what you said about the um, atmospheric correction because we've had similar sorts of problems with data like that for the UK. Have you got any idea about the likely size of the errors that you get, which are the result of that um, problem with atmospheric correction? Well, I'm sorry, but because I'm not involved in the technical team doing really doing the atmospheric correction, but at our last meeting, also with, with the uh, ESA project officer, we discussed the, this issue because it's, it's a core issue. I mean, you invest uh, billions of, of euros in the satellite image infrastructure and uh, the, the download infrastructure and the processing inf infrastructure is really lacking behind a, a lot. And so now people like in the UK, like, like everywhere dealing with this, they, this data try uh, to improve this data and really to calculate something like a cent S2A products or bottom of the atmosphere. And it's, I think there, there's a large increase in efficiency if we once have, would have solved this. Any other questions? Jeff. Thanks, Gebhard. Um, looking at this uh, capture in the phenological change, um, you mentioned this sort of from to uh, component of the data model. Is there any um, possibility to capture um, things like the peak of the growing season, length of growing season, etc., sort of like a more of a, a summary phenological statistic for each of the objects? So from the modeling point of view, it's no problem because under parametric observation, you can include every kind of phenological indicator, so length of season, start of season, end of season. Uh, the problem until now is that, I mean, all these phenological indicators have, to my um, knowledge, been developed on MODIS data until now. So it will take some time uh, that we adapt it to the higher spatial resolution and um, coarser uh, temporal resolution because I mean, as I've shown you, and this area is, is really the, the most sunny area in Austria. And even here, we have a lack within the vegetation period now of, of six weeks. So uh, the question on the one side is, yes, we can store these parameters, but can we derive these uh, parameters in a meaningful way? OK, thank you very much. Uh, I have plenty of questions, but I have a conflict of interest trying to keep to time as chair. So we'll, we'll move on. We'll discuss this afterwards. But thank you for an excellent talk. Gebhard. OK, the next presenter um, in this session is Dr. Jeff Smith. Uh, I haven't checked um, everyone's job titles before we start, so I'm going to guess all of them with all the speakers. I'm guessing Jeff is something like managing director of Spectro Natura. It certainly sounds good. And Jeff uh, has worked uh, long and hard with uh, Sentinel products, working with uh, European uh, collaborations on this. So he's going to give us some introduction to the Sentinels themselves and then how they can be used in habitat mapping. 
Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and hopefully some of the things I'm going to say will uh, run in parallel with what uh, Gebhardt was just talking about there. Um, one of the main drivers for what we try and do is to sort of take this satellite information, however that's collected, whether it be radar or optical, and in some way process it through to becoming some kind of report or synopsis or summary of the state of the environment. And this is the European Environment Agency's uh, State and Outlook report. Um, and, you know, it's not a simple task to go from that base image and take it all the way through to a set of summary information. Um, and so what we're doing is we're breaking that process down into a number of stages. Um, and we start at the top here with the actual Earth observation imagery and possibly some ancillary data. Uh, and then we take that and then we create either some land cover information, like we heard from uh, Gebhardt there, and biophysical properties. Uh, and only at that point then do we start to th start thinking about whether that, what habitats do those uh, inf properties and information represent. And then later on we actually move on to say, uh, you know, what is the biodiversity assessment or condition? What are the ecosystem services offered by these areas? Um, and if we look at, uh, alongside each of those arrows, if we see how those things are produced, we can see that the first arrow there be between earth observation data and the land cover and biophysical properties can be quite an automated, quite an efficient uh, process where we can um, apply kind of, uh, you know, big processing capabilities to. Uh, and then as we get further down the tree, we see we need to involve more local knowledge, like Gebhardt was saying, including the local experts and their habitat experiences, et cetera. And then finally, the, the expert knowledge we need for biodiversity assessments. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we're looking at how we deal with this top part of the plot here, how we take the Earth observation data and convert it into some basic products that can then support habitat, uh, both habitat mapping and condition, and also the uh, biodiversity assessments. And one of the bottlenecks that we've uh, come up against, well, the whole set of bottlenecks that we've uh, had in place during most of my Earth observation career um, has involved the sort of lack of data. So even uh, with the Sentinel-2 data that Gebhardt showed, there's still gaps in that time series and we have trouble filling those in. Uh, in the past, we may have had maybe one image every few years for some parts, especially when we're produce, trying to produce maps of the whole of the UK, certain areas would not have an, update, um, an image available in the time period that we're looking at. Uh, and then even if the data had been collected, we had a cloud-free day, then the issues of how we discover that data is available. It could be owned by various different organisations. How we then access it, download it, uh, make it accessible to our processing systems. And all the various pre-processing, uh, product delivery, um, product definition type stages, they've all been bottlenecks which has constrained the exploitation of EO data. And so now with the launch of the Sentinels, we're hopefully going to try and get over some of those bottlenecks, particularly this lack of data. Um, and as uh, Gebhardt said, we're going to have, we should soon be having two Sentinel-2 satellites flying, so that should uh, remove some of those issues. And we've also got a fleet of other Sentinel satellites. So um, they're all called, they're all called Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, et cetera. And each of those numbers refers to a different type of satellite. And within each of those types, there are multiple examples. So Sentinel 2A, 2B will fly, followed by 2C, 2D, et cetera. So there's a, a long time series of satellites going to be in place, collecting a broad range of, uh, of measurements. So this is a great opportunity. Uh, but we've also, as we've also heard, there's a massive challenge as well. So we've gone from a point in time which I like to describe as sitting there waiting for a tap to drip, a dripping tap to drip, when we were trying to get hold of Earth observation data. And now we're going to be in a complete deluge. Uh, we're now looking at even individual sentinel systems producing tens of terabytes of data per day. And so how can we... There? It's a massive opportunity, but how can we exploit that? And so I want to sort of go over some of those, uh, the options now and, uh, and offer a sort of way forward for that. Um, and what we've developed is this idea of intermediate products, which is a you know, very commonplace activity in lots of things like manufacturing and process industries, etc., where various components of a final product are put together by often by specialised companies or companies that can do or organisations that can do things, that particular task very efficiently. Uh, and that then results in higher quality, better consistency, uh, and often then reduce costs, um, and the fact that we can actually then reuse information. So this idea of intermediate products as a step between the input data, or the raw materials, so to speak, and then the final product that we want out at the end. 
And if we look at that in the context of Earth observation data uh, and, and what we require for our, our habitat mapping or our landscape assessments, then what we're looking at is a set of basic surface properties. So in, um, things that we know about the surface that where we can agree on their specification, uh, we know they can be measured quite robustly over time uh, and, and also used by a large number of people. So we want to have a multi-use uh, outcome for this. And we need to also make sure that the results we're producing are going to be spatially and temporally consistent so that if people are using them to drive models in different parts of the country or different parts of the world, that they will then end up with the same um, uh, equivalent results coming out of those models. And there's already some examples of this. This is not uh, something that we've uh, created out of thin air ourselves. Uh, and what a good example is the, U, the NASA MODIS mission, which is a... Uh, medium resolution instrument which collects data between t with pixel sizes of between 250 meters and a uh, 250 meters and a kilometer. Uh, they regularly collect data across the whole of the globe, and then instead of releasing the data, uh, the well, the, you can get the, the actual data, but uh, well, another way of, uh, of of accessing it is to actually get these inter intermediate products. And so what they do is they they composite all the time series of imagery together. Uh, and deliver products on a regular basis. So what we've got here is this, it's a normalized difference vegetation index. It's a, uh, an indicator of vegetation uh, vigor and, uh, and density. Uh, and they produce it on an eight-day basis, but each, that eight-day composite will be made up of multiple images that have been collected. So this tries to avoid the issues of cloud cover, so that if it's cloudy on one day, uh, an image the next day will hopefully be cloud-free, etc. Uh, and they, they do normally do this over uh, short periods of time, so eight or 16 days. And so this kind of composite data set then, rather than the user having to download thousands of individual image scenes, they just download this one composite image that's been prepared in advance on an automated system using consistent methods. Um, and a similar kind of approach is now being developed in the UK. Uh, to work at a finer spatial resolution and to be targeted towards uh, UK requirements. Uh, and this is based on this um, requirement from government now that we need to make more use of Earth observation data uh, to generate cost savings and, and to be more efficient and to produce higher quality results. Uh, they want to improve their evidence and policy development, etc. So they really seeing the Sentinel era this arrival of Sentinel data is a great opportunity for them to move forward. Uh, and what we've done, we've already done one project. We're just starting a new project on uh, developing these intermediate project concepts. Uh, and this is going to be a based around a central hosting activity where the, the, the imagery and the products are available to a broad range of users. But these then will then be consistent. And then the, as we go back, we look, think back to that bottlenecks of EEO activity. We now have easier discovery. Uh, a common portal to access everything, better access, and also the provision of data bundles. So if you needed, uh, for instance, uh, an elevation model as well as your satellite-based products, you can then capture those or collect those in, in one uh, simple step. Uh, and finally, this, there's a new concept that uh, of actually not, instead of downloading data, you leave the data on the central portal and then you upload your algorithm to run on that portal. Uh, based around the concept of cloud computing. So we're now ma making the data accessible, but also giving the processing functionality, making that accessible to, to the users to upload their own algorithms. Uh, and this is just a schematic of the, uh, the, concept, uh, the collaborative node concept, which sits at the center of this, uh, this process. So we have a node which will then ingest information, satellite imagery from Sentinel-2, for instance, but it could be other satellites and other data sources. And then it makes them available to the users through one central key point, which, you know, it's, that's quite a reasonable idea. But what we're adding to that is a set of additional services which link to that node to, first of all, do pre-processing so that the issues like the uh, atmospheric correction that was talked about earlier, the cloud masking and compositing, those sort of tasks are done, for, um, are done centrally so the user doesn't have to be concerned with those. And of course, what I'm talking about here, this generation of the intermediate products, that's also done, linked through to the node and made available to the users. So as a user, you then just download the information you require, not this huge um, 
uh, deluge of, inf of, of actual raw imagery. And so that, that what they refer to as the heavy lifting of that process in TAS is then taken out. Uh, and then as a user, you're, you can use the data more effectively. Three? Okay. So we'll just run a, through a quick example. This is what we did in our first project, um, was to take uh, Landsat data as Sentinel-2 well, wasn't fully available at this time as an example, and then we went through this pre-processing, so atmospheric correction and cloud masking, and then we chained together all these processes and made a, a workflow that could be automated and, and presented to the node. And on the right, just see, this is a standard product that you would download if you went to a portal and just got the imagery. We were then applied a atmospheric correction and a cloud mask to that, so we can see that in the magenta is the clouds, and then you can't quite see them on here, but yellow is the cloud shadows, etc. And, uh, and haze, cloud shadow and haze in yellow. Uh, and then from that, we then have a, an indicator product. So this is a normalized difference vegetation index. So this is just now one layer with all the, the cloud holes, pu uh, clouds punched out, and, the, uh, uh, and, and so all those things that would affect your results have then kind of been removed there. Uh, but not only that, we were then able to sort of composite those together. So the, the colors in this image represent data from different input dates. So there's three, there's green, red, and yellow there, the, the three, there's three image dates there that have been composited together uh, in order to produce one complete image. You can still see there's some little, some black patches there where we still have no data, but the rest of the, this is an NDVI image again, and this shows that we can composite them together to make, over time, like that MODIS image, we can also have a, uh, a near comprehensive cover. Uh, and then from that, we can then take those composited images over different time periods, and then we can drill down through time. So we've got time along the bottom here, NDVI up the y-axis, and you can see there there's some profiles for, in this case, uh, deciduous woodlands in red, and you can see the sort of phenological cycle as it greens up through the summer, and then, uh, and then senesces. Coniferous woodlands a lot more flat, uh, and then much lower, but also flat is uh, urban areas because they're not vegetated, so they're just a constant background value. Right, just a couple of quick examples of how we can then exploit that. So this is a, a forest change indicator product where we've taken um, uh, another indicator of forest cover here. This tells us the area of forest and then we've used that time series to identify areas where the forest has changed. So we've then produced a mask where, uh, of changes and then we combine those together so we find not only the changes but the changes that occurred within forested areas and that allows um, foresters or forest managers then to update their databases to, uh, to account for the felling or wind throw or disease infestation of the forest. Uh, and here's another example where we've used, uh, this is a normalized, uh, normalized water index this time. So this is um, giving you an indication of the moisture content or the amount of water on the surface within a set of um, grassland fields in a... Um, uh, a lowland sort of floodplain context. This is the Halvergate marshes in um, Suffolk, I think it is. And the, but what we're looking at here is we're looking at the dates of imagery where we get the lowest value and the highest value of that indicator. And so that's then really useful for, for, uh, for landscape managers then to assess where the uh, different management practices are being applied to different fields in this landscape. And I guess I'm being pushed towards the end now. <laughs> so just to summarize, I think intermediate products are going to be in a really important step in allowing us to take this massive deluge of data, compress it into something that's a lot more digestible, and then use it in things such as habitat mapping. Uh, it makes this sort of, um, the sort of download volumes that you'll have much more, uh, much more bearable. Uh, th 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 it's probably about time to finish, but I think these sort of things are now going to be vital for driving our reporting at both, well, habitat extent and condition, so we can see this change over time, but also being able to scale up to the UK and then European sort of levels. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. <coughs> Any quick questions for Jeff? Okay, please. Um, 
um, for many applications. But one of the problems that I uh, find when trying to use process products is that they don't well describe the errors um, that have come through the modeling assumptions within yeah. them. Um, and actually, it tends to make them unusable in, in many instances because uh, we can't run the errors through the models and, and really understand what change might actually be happening and what might be an artifact. And I was wondering if you might comment on any improvements you see for these products. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point. Um, and one of the things that's often lacking is the kind of level of metadata that goes along with the, the products. I mean, I think one of the issues with errors, certainly we found it while testing out the uh, NDVI products in this project, was the fact that there isn't actually any ground data for NDVI to actually... So certain of these indicator products, it's very difficult to find a reference set against which you can validate uh, errors. The, the, the one thing we are now looking at is the fact that because we're now seeing changes over time, rely, you know, we get enough images to see the changes over time, that we can actually then use that as a kind of surrogate for accuracy. So if we expect a, uh, a forest to behave in a certain way or we expect a grassland to behave in a certain way. So you don't have to measure exactly an absolute value of NDVI but you can look at the, the relative changes, such as the cutting density, cutting frequency, and are we picking up that type of uh, activity. But yes, you're completely right, and I think that's one of the issues going from towards products, uh, is to actually have accuracy and sufficient metadata applied to them. That, and and in, in a way that you, the metadata can be ingested automatically as well, so your model not only takes the data, but takes the metadata and, and uses it. Thank you. We are very tight for time. You know 13-minute talks are impossible on a very tight schedule, so we, we must press on. So our next speaker, uh, very pleased to have along today from Environment Systems, one of our sponsors, Dr. Katie Medcalf is Senior Research Scientist, something like that. Environment I think. Director, yeah. There we go, Environment Maybe Director. Right. And she's going to tell us about using Sentinel data for natural capital assessment. Excellent, thank you. It's really good to be with you this afternoon and to be able to share with you our vision for Sentinel data for natural capital assessment. Natural capital is the environmental stock or resource from which humans derive a wide range of services. These services can sometimes be called ecosystem services, and we heard in a talk this morning that um, we needn't uh, be particularly precious about our use of ecosystem services and natural capital, um, but we can be chameleon-like depending on who we're talking about, talking with, with the two terms. But what, what is um, fixed with these ecosystem services are that, that they are spatially explicit. The type and volume of a service depends on the key environmental factors present at that particular part of the Earth's surface. So, um, and it depends on um, what the habitat is, the land cover, um, is it a grassland, is it a woodland? Is it on the top of a hill, on flatland, or is it on steeply sloping land, or is it right next to the river? Um, so the hydrology and the landform the soil and geology, uh, which uh, we'll only touch on very briefly here, um, and how the area is managed. So this is the um, imposition by man, so whether it's got a road over it, is, is it managed as a nature reserve, etc. Um, these features of natural capital or ecosystem services were put in a framework for a JNCC DEFRA project, which is listed at the bottom, and they've actually been developed into a framework called SENSE, um, and you can find more details about that if you're interested on our website. Habitat is often the key feature of um, these systems in terms of natural capital, particularly semi-natural habitats. They're generally resilient, diverse and have a characteristic set of main cover forming species. They tend to support fully functioning systems with many trophic levels and this full, fully functioning um, many trophic levels is what helps them intercept and filter rainfall to help st store water um, and, fill, and provide purification for water, they store and sequester carbon, they stabilise the soil preventing erosion etc etc. Some of these semi-natural communities can be related to their environment in such an extent that they can be used to proxy the soil geology, providing you know enough about the landscape and landform in which they occur. 
An example of that might be if you have an intact peat bog in, West Wales, in mid Wales, you might be talking about a peat layer of between a metre and two metres. If you're in Sutherland in Scotland, then you might be talking six to 12 metres of peat. It's a very poor approximation, but it does give you some impact, um, some idea of what soil and geology might be under the system. Uh, because that's often the hardest data to get hold of for natural capital evaluation. How can remote sensing help? Well, um, remote sensing, as Jeff and Gerhardt have so ably um, presented to us, particularly Sentinel-2, optical data, you can relate to key cover-forming species. So whether you have a broadleafed woodland, um, an ancient woodland, which is oak and ash dominated, then that will be spectrally different to a coniferous plantation. Um, when you look at Sentinel-1 data, which is radar data, then you've got a Sentinel um, image that shows a combination of structure, productivity, and water features. And here you can start looking at vegetation structure, landform, that type of issue. An example of the two images, um, the optical image, uh, this is coloured up so that the near-infrared band, which equates to vegetation productivity, is in the red. So the very bright orange are um, very productive arable fields, and the blue is desert. This, these images are from Peru. The radar image um, is, has a number of advantages, not least because it penetrates clouds, so you don't get that gap in your a time series when the satellite doesn't go through. And as I say, this sort of measures the vegetation structure, um, productivity and water relations. So Sentinel um, 1 and 2 near global coverage at the moment every six days, 12 or 24 days, depending on which part of the world you're in. And we go back to 2015, so already a really useful data set. Moving on to Sentinel-1, these are some Sentinel-1 images that show land texture. I always like to think of it as Sentinel-2 is what you see, Sentinel-1 would be what you would feel. So here we've coloured up the Sentinel-1 image to show the red band, the copolarization. So you're sending down a vertical pulse and you're receiving back at the center a vertical pulse. So this is showing you smooth things on, and, and sort of a height type feature. Um, the green band we've colored up as cross polarization. So you're sending down a vertical signal and receiving back a horizontal. So this shows you if it's got a lot of texture, a lot of leaves. Um, and the blue is the ratio between them. This gives you a really useful product to start looking at things, particularly maybe your intertidal areas. Uh, you can see uh, the sand dune complex here and the mudflat complex here. And this passes every six days at the moment, um, a tremendous resource. Applications of Sentinel-1 data, I know that um, we're going to hear more about agricultural top crop type, but condition of the crop soil moisture measurement so our forest, we can estimate our biomass. Um, uh, as Jeff showed, we can look at things like fire scar mapping, wind blow, hydrology. We can look at wetlands and snow covers. And it's not just related to the terrestrial environment. In the ocean environment, we have sea ice identification, wind field measurements, oil spill detection, ship detections. Ships might not um, immediately cross your mind as a natural capital feature, but actually the social and man-made use of the environment is key to natural capital evaluation. Crops have unique seasonal signatures. I'm not going to dwell on this because um, I think Dan's going to cover it. You're not? Okay. I'll, I'll really quickly go through it then. So um, as you go through the year, each crop has a particular growth form. So now as you've got in Sentinel-1 a particular time series, you can actually start to separate out your um, winter wheat, your wheat from uh, your um, temporary grasslands. What's even more important for natural capital evaluation, though, is that you can start to look at winter versus spring cereals by looking at your time series across it. Spring cereals have a very different ecosystem service and natural capital uh, value than winter cereals. Winter cereals mean that you've sown them um, November time um, and they're green over the winter so that there's some root capacity there to stop soil erosion happening. Spring sown cereals are often bare fields over the winter with the correspondent er erosion channels um, present. 
uh, and they give you some very pretty images. Um, <clears throat> the other thing Sentinel One's great for is looking at change in environment. So this is from a project in the Camargue in France, um, and I've just highlighted here a change in the water bodies uh, as it goes through the season and expands and contracts. Really useful if we're looking at water relations for our natural capital evaluation. Um, we've heard about data availability. This is a time series um, of data processed over the UK. Um, and going to be fed to you as a data service. It's a web-based service, it's always on, um, and it's accessible data under the open data arena. Um, and we're at the moment, slight plug here, looking for early adopters. So if any of them, any one of you would like to use this data for your research, please come talk to me afterwards. I didn't say any of that. <laughs> um, Sentinel-2 data, we've heard a lot about this. This is an example of Sentinel-2 for the Peak District National Park More Life Project, where we were looking at a very fine scale of habitat map that we then went on to look at the opportunity space for natural capital evaluation in terms of where there are um, peat bogs that have been drained that aren't performing to the full extent of their natural capital, where um, remedial action could take place and they could then start functioning in a much more robust way. This is an example of the type of analysis that goes in when we've got our Sentinel 1 or 2 data um, and where we can join it with all the other data sets that we collect for our natural capital evaluation. And this is actually looking at opportunity space, so where you can enhance the natural capital of an area. It's for Sonar, which is the Welsh Assembly um, uh, Natural Resources Wales and Welsh Assembly project um, behind the Wales um, Environment Act and the Wales Wellbeing Act. So we've got our data sets across the top, which we put in. We've got our ecological knowledge, which we're feeding in from the bottom. And we've got our various processing chains, which results in um, a map such as this, which shows the opportunities to enhance the land contribution to flood risk. Just this one's looking at three issues, where you'd plant trees mid-catchment to get the best slowing of water, where you'd um, undertake bog restoration, and where you'd create wet woodlands on the side of your river channels to help stabilise the bank and slow water um, and help the floodplain function properly. Um, yeah, grand. These um, maps I've shown you already are about terrestrial ecosystem services, but it doesn't stop there. Marine ecosystem services are just as important um, and just as useful to put in uh, satellite data as well as all the other data that we collect. This is the northern half of the island of Anguilla. It's a small island in the Caribbean Sea just below Puerto Rico. Um, uh, it's a limestone slab. It has no fresh water in the ordinary circumstances on the land, and it has, um, because it's very shallow, uh, very low lying land, the coral reefs are immensely important. This is the uh, suspended sediments um, from Landsat, actually, uh, which we're using at that time because it was all that was available in 2013. And you can see that there's some definite um, areas where it's concentrated. We were very lucky in that a Landsat satellite passed two days post Hurricane Gonzalo and we were able to map the suspended sediments again by mapping the dry channels um, on the island that run in rainfall events we were able to start looking at the spatial con correlation between the dry channels and where the sediment was coming off the land and where you have particular problems we were able to then track that back to where we were having um, coral reef problems as well. Very quickly, Horizon 2020 project called Eco Potential is looking at all these features um, on how ecosystem service benefits can be uh, found through Earth observation. And they're looking at these things called essential variables. This is at the very beginning part of the project, and I'm sure uh, this project will be presented as it goes on um, at this and many other conferences. Um, we've already looked at how Sentinel data is being used as a holistic evidence base for natural capital evaluation. I'm not by any chance suggesting you can use it um, instead of other information um, or 
uh, not use all the information that we'd already use, but it is a fantastic tool that adds to our data stack, that adds to our knowledge. And we've already used it extensively for spatial planning, planning, targeting natural flood management, ecological networks and connectivity analysis, green infrastructure, biodiversity plans, ecosystem services and marine planning at a range of scales from national to local. So satellite information and central information is already feeding in uh, in a big way. They're game changers, Sentinel-1 and 2, for all the reasons we've just heard. They provide spatially explicit variables which help describe the type and, more important, status and condition of the habitat, which means that our models about the ecosystem services and the natural capital can become, become more and more accurate. The frequency of cover means that we can look at seasonality and landscape changes in a way we've not been able to do before. Uh, Natural capital and ecosystem service maps are being used to help our understand our environment in a wide range of circumstances. That example I showed from the National Ecosystem Assessment for Anguilla was pivotal to help policymakers who'd never thought of it before understand why people got so um, het up about illegal development on the coast. Because um, it showed the issues in a way that had never been done before. So they're an excellent um, communication tool and uh, I'm really excited about the future few years. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very broad ranging talk. Natural capital covers a lot of stuff like remote <laughs> sensing and synoptic <laughs> view. So some excellent and varied examples. Any quick questions for Katie? Can I ask Katie, um, I was interested in, so some of these projects, obviously en environment systems in involved in some of these many and varied projects. And that um, data product that you're rolling out, uh, providing uh, some seamless data of the UK, what value are you adding over the Sentinel products that are freely available centrally for any user to, to access? So it's the sort of things that Jeff was talking about. So it's a one-stop shop. It's data, so data discovery, all the pre-processing has been done. It's a seamless image from north to south of the UK, um, and it's presented um, in an appropriate way for analysis with the VV, VH and the ratio. So you, you select whichever part of the UK you want. You don't have to take the whole thing because it's, it's picking our way through these massive data yeah. sets, which is one of the, yeah. the greatest challenges yeah. with Sentinels. This is why we're after early adopters. What would people find most useful in terms of calling the data down? Um, and we're very much committed to the open data structure for this data set. So we're very, really interested in learning from people what they'd find interesting. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you very much, Katie. Our next presenter. So now we move to uh, Lancaster University, another member of NEON, uh, the organizers of the conference. So it's a, a great delight to have uh, Dr. Kunming Wang uh, join us today. Uh, Kunming is a, a postdoctoral researcher uh, at, the, uh, at U Lancaster University. He's going to talk us about uh, creating daily high resolution uh, Sentinel time series data. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon everyone. Uh, the orig original speaker of this uh, topic should be Peter Arkison, but he is very busy with his duties in Lancaster. So today I will give this topic um, uh, on his behalf. Uh, the title is about creating daily Sentinel 2 images. Uh, and uh, I will uh, talk from three parts. First, I will introduce the motivation and uh, in the second part, I will introduce explicitly the methods I used, and finally, uh, we will go to the experiments and the conclusions. Okay, for the first part, why we should uh, uh, do this uh, for uh, producing daily Sentinel 2 images? Um, we know Sentinel 2 and Sentinel 3 are two uh, newly launched satellites uh, in these two years. However, these two um, uh, satellites are very different. Uh, uh, more pre, uh, specifically, for Sentinel-2, we have uh, five special resolution data uh, in around 10 meters, 20 meters. However, the temporal resolution is around 10 days. Uh, this can be increased to uh, five days with two uh, objects uh, uh, satellite pair. However, this should be uh, under the conditional uh, clear skies. For Sentinel-3, uh, the temporal resolution uh, is uh, very, very high. It's around less than two days. This means nearly uh, every day. 
but the spatial resolution is very close. It's around 300 meters. So um, uh, what we should do for the five spatial and the temporal resolution monitoring, uh, for example, for philology monitoring? Okay, so in this topic, I will introduce something about uh, uh, fusion of Century 2 and Century 3. We can see from this table, um, Century 2 and Century 3 have four bands. They have the same wavelengths. We can see from the, uh, the wavelengths of Century 2 here and the Century 3 here. They have uh, nearly the same wavelengths. So this uh, provides a, a very good opportunity to uh, combine these uh, two types of satellite data. Uh, we, we should load from here, um, for Century 2, 8A band, it has a spatial resolution, spatial resolution of 20 meters. So um, beforehand, we should uh, downscale this band to 10 meters using these three 10 meters bands. Uh, and uh, we uh, 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 perform this based on the uh, ATPRK approach. And uh, the approach and the image fusion pro problem uh, uh, has already been uh, published in our uh, previous papers on RSE. Um, we can see from this uh, 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 example, uh, by combining the five spatial resolution but coarse temporal resolution Century 2 data with the uh, coarse spatial resolution but five temporal resolution Century 3 data, we can finally get the five spatial resolution and the five temporal resolution data here. Uh, in the second part, I will introduce uh, the methods uh, I used and uh, uh, developed. Um, uh, fusion of Century 2 and Century 3 is a typical uh, spatial, temper, uh, spatial temporal fusion uh, problem. However, uh, we, should, uh, we, we usually suffer uh, some big problems. One is that we can usually have very few Century 2 images um, because of the cloud contamination. For example, um, Sometimes in one year, we may only have one or two uh, uh, good quality Century 2 images. So this uh, may uh, need to affect less uh, the available Century 2 images to the uh, uh, Century 2 image. We need to predict that for these two times, the temporal change should be very large. We, we can see from an example here, uh, we have uh, uh, three, uh, we have the Century 3 image at T1 and the T2. Uh, we can see uh, the temporal changes are very large because we can see the color of the vegetation are very different. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, usually we only have one uh, uh, Century 2 image at T1. So what we need to do is to predict the Century 2 image at the T2 using only three images. Um, uh, 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 facing the uh, very big temporal change, uh, we developed a new method called uh, RMBRRC. It's an uh, abbreviation of three st steps, RMBRRC, and uh, the full name is regression modeling and the broker removal and the residual compensation. Um, I will just uh, uh, show you uh, uh, explicitly uh, the method, uh, uh, how it works with a very small area. Uh, the small area is uh, marked as blue areas here. Okay, so I will just show uh, how it works from this small area. We have um, we have the two uh, Century 3 images at T1 and T2, and we also have the Century 2 image at T1. So um, in the first step, we, we get the regression model uh, between the T1 and the T2 from the Century 3 images, but uh, it should be pointed out that uh, we use the local regression model because the spatial variation is very large, especially for the 300 meters Century 3 images. So we use the local regression, regression model. That means the regression model is uh, uh, built on a, a pixel basis at the 300 meters. So uh, based on the regression model, uh, we can get the coefficients A and B. and uh, uh, the, very, uh, the meaning of variables are here. I can get the A and B, and then we use this, this regression model to get the uh, first step prediction, we call it RM prediction. Um, because the regression mo model is built at 300 meters, so uh, um, now usually some uh, block artifacts in the RM, pr RM prediction, we can see from the, uh, the difference between the uh, uh, labeling cost pixels. For example, uh, these two colors are very different. So in the second stage, we, we, we did something to remove the block artifacts. Um, we, um, 
we achieve this by using a special field. Um, it means the special uh, linear combination of the labeling uh, uh, pixels uh, at uh, 10 meters. However, um, it should be uh, pointed out that we do not use all labeling uh, pixels because in this scheme, we need to offer smooth result. So we only use the similar uh, labeling pixels, and these pixels are searched from uh, exist, uh, available central tool image at T1. And we can get a second step prediction here. We can see by this special filtering uh, scheme, we can get much more uh, natural uh, feasible uh, uh, inspection result. We can see the block artifacts here are nearly removed. We can also see from here. So uh, this is the uh, uh, benefit of the second step. However, um, we learned from the uh, first step uh, based on regression that are residuals. So um, the pred prediction of the second step usually have spectral distortion. We can see, if, uh, we also have the re reference here. We can see this color and uh, the color of this part is very different from the reference here. So in the second stage, uh, we performed uh, a residual composition, we call it RC. So, um, we perform this uh, 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 in some um, steps. Uh, 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 first, we get the residuals at 300 meters, and then, uh, we first interpolate it to uh, 10 meters using some very simple, for example, bilinear or by cubic interpolation. Then uh, we use the ob object information from central to uh, the T1, and then we uh, average the uh, residuals within each object and then we can get the uh, residuals in units of objects. And finally, we add the uh, residuals to the uh, to this prediction. We can get the prediction here. We can see the color here is very close to the reference. And we can also see uh, from this part, the color is, is also very similar to the reference. Um, we performed uh, the experiments on, on two data sets uh, for validation of the uh, proposed methods. And the two uh, data sets are from two different agriculture uh, areas in, uh, area in Australia. And the special size is around 50, uh, 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers. That means uh, 1,500 uh, pixels by 1,500 central two pixels, and also uh, 50 by 50 central three pixels. Um, we marked uh, uh, the two different time as T1 and T2. What we uh, uh, need to do is to use the center three at the T1 and the T2 with the center two at the T1 to predict the center two at the T2. Uh, we also can pass uh, the new method with two benchmark methods. One is the very popular STARF uh, FM pr uh, uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Gaofeng in USDA. And also compared it with a lot of uh, method called special unmixing, we also call it SU. Uh, here is the results for uh, the first data set. Um, we used the Central 2 data set at, at T1 and the Central, uh, uh, Central 3 data set at T2 to uh, predict the Central 2 data at T2. Uh, here is the reference for, uh, for the Central 2 data at, uh, at T2, and uh, here this line is the Methods uh, is the results of three methods uh, of ST, ARFM, and SU, and our our methods. Uh, we can, we can at, at the first uh, at the first check we can uh, see very clearly that ST, ARFM have um, uh, serious spectral distortion uh, because of the uh, widely widely existed uh, mixed pixels. For SU, it produced uh, um, almost most results for uh, for. Each, each objects also it, it also can contain some uh, blocky artifacts, and uh, uh, for our methods it produced the results uh, uh, that is most closely to the reference here. Uh, okay, here is the results for our data set. We can also have the same conclusion uh, for the first data sets. Uh, we, uh, we also uh, performed the uh, quantitative assessments. Uh, by this column, we can see that T1 and T2 have very low correlation. That means the, spe uh, the temporal changes are very big, so uh, the two data sets have very uh, little correlation. 
So um, because of the uh, strong temporal change, uh, the uh, two methods, STF um, and SU, have um, a very uh, uh, little CC and ULKI and a very large RMSE. Um, we also compare uh, our methods with the, these two methods. Uh, uh, we can, and we can see uh, from the mean value uh, as I mark it in the uh, red path, we can see the CC and ULKI um, uh, much larger than uh, these, these two methods, and also the RMSE is uh, much smaller. So we can conclude the promos, uh, the promos, uh, new methods can increase uh, the accuracy very obviously. Okay, so, so this is the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Kunming? Mark. Can you hear me? <laughs> so the size of the fields is similar to the size mm. of the course resolution data. And what I'm interested in is whether the method depends on that fact or whether it would work where the scale of variation was finer in general than the size of the objects that you were trying to work with. Does that, um, make, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 I, I see. I think this is a very, uh, is a very insightful question. And um, first, we should, uh, I need to highlight that for Senior 2, it has a sp uh, special resolution around 10 meters. That means uh, usually for an object, it should uh, occupy for uh, maybe at least one or two uh, pixels. So um, usually an, an object should occupy uh, uh, many pixels. So uh, our method have uh, potential for this uh, problem of fusion of Senior 2 and Senior 3. Um, at, the, at the current stage, we test our method with the, uh, uh, with the two uh, agriculture area as shown here. And of course, in the, in the future stage, we will test our method with uh, areas with very large special variations. Of course, yeah. Get part, please. Thank you. It was very interesting to, to see this combination. Mm. My question is, uh, what was uh, your specific reason why to select a December scene and to compare to an August scene? So it's, for me, a very long time in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, we have seen the, these problems, for example, that I had. Mm. I was missing uh, an observation within a six-week period. Mm. And, and mm. so I was thinking, would it be helpful for you to take always the two last sentinel two scenes, so the yeah. start and, and the end where you would like to arrive, yeah. and then interpolate in between, because we know that more or less that the spectral signature that is mm. expected. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, of course. Uh, however, as, as I just uh, mentioned at the very beginning of uh, this uh, PBT, uh, we mentioned that uh, usually uh, not very few uh, of, uh, Good quality senior two images because of the cloud and the shadow contamination. So, yeah, we, we of course uh, want uh, very uh, as much uh, as many senior two images as possible. However, that, that is always not always the case because of the cloud contamination. Yeah, if we have uh, many senior two images, we can use uh, all of them, of course. Yeah. Okay. Again, we need to press on. So, can I refer any final questions to after the session? Thank you very much for an excellent technical talk, Kunming. Okay, uh, how are we all feeling? These two-hour sessions are very long, aren't they? I don't know if you're feeling jaded at all. I chaired a, a two-hour session at the RSP SOC conference earlier this year, and I stopped it halfway through and made the audience do five star jumps to freshen them up. So if you'd stand up, please. No, don't, don't bother. We won't do that today. Okay, we'll move on. I, I do know the, uh, the next speaker, I know his job title, a colleague at Edge Hill University. So it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Chris Marston, a postdoctoral researcher uh, working at Edge Hill. And he's gonna tell us today about some of the work we've been conducting uh, on uh, Savannah 
uh, habit habitat mapping uh, now using Sentinel data. Chris. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. So again, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris Marston. I'm a postdoc based at Edge Hill, not far away from here. And I wanted to say today's um, session just to introduce some work that myself and Paul and Dave Wilkinson, who's also here in the audience, um, have been doing along with other collaborators looking at using remote sensing for woody habitat discrimination in quite highly heterogeneous African landscapes. And in particular, how we've used time series sentinel data to help us do this. Now, we're particularly interested in here in savannah landscapes. Now, savannas are one of the largest terrestrial biomes that cover approximately 20% of the Earth's land surface, and they're characterized by um, a combination of grassland and a woody or tree overstory um, of variable densities. Um, they're very much dynamic systems, so depending on the respective influence of a number of drivers, such as fire, precipitation, raising our atmospheric carbon dioxide, they can alternate between states of open grassland or closed woodlands or various different states in between. And this has varying importances and significance in terms of biodiversity, things such as species distributions and abundance, trophic interactions, spatial patterns of soil fertility and moisture, and some ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration. Now, one phenomenon that's been increasingly reported in African savannas, and which is quite a, of quite a lot of concern for land managers and conservation practitioners, is that of woody encroachment. So this is, this is illustrated quite well in this series of photos I'm going to show. So this is from a site in uh, South Africa. It's a photo taken in 1925 of an area which is predominantly open grassland. We can see there are some um, trees present. If you look at another photo from the same location from 1993, we can see there's been an increase in the amount of tree cover present there, but the area is still predominantly open grassland. If we look again at 2011, we can see there's been a really broad and stark increase in the amount of tree cover that's present in this area. So not only has the tree cover increased a lot, but there's, this has happened over a relatively short space of time, so just between 1993 and 2011. And this is a phenomenon that's been quite widely reported across African savannas. So this wood encroachment, it has significant impacts in terms of uh, local biodiversity in these areas. So forage, forage availability for different herbivore species, predator-prey interactions, and also some unexpected impacts such as for uh, game viewing and tourism. And there's also reports of this <coughs> occurring um, at other locations, such as Australia. So it's been increasingly recognised this woody encroachment within savannas could be a globally prevalent phenomenon. Now, we can monitor this phenomenon to some degree through field surveys, in-situ surveys, which are great for informing at a local scale what's going on, but can't necessarily be applied more broadly because of the logistics of carrying out this type of work. So this is re really where remote sensing offers possibilities for this broad-scale monitoring. Um, and this is the focus of which our work took. So we were keen on looking to see whether we could monitor this woody encroachment and use it to develop uh, a broad-scale cost-effective monitoring tool for, for land managers to use. So we chose a study area at Kruger National Park in South Africa. Now, we're quite lucky in this respect that um, Paul, one of, Paul Applin, one of our collaborators, had done some work in this area previously, back in 2001, 2002. So we already had good quality field data from this area um, and three high-resolution images from QuickBird and Iconos uh, from the corresponding time period. So we had really rich historical data sets to work from, which was great. The study area itself, it comprised a mix of habitats, so we had areas of open grassland, uh, we had more established woodland, certainly um, among the river, along the river banks, an area of um, bare areas as well, this is a dried riverbed. Areas of shrubs, so thorny ricacia thicket, and this was of particular interest in our study. There's also areas of open water, so freshwater swamp along the rivers that flowed all year round and also low biomass grassland, which is typically associated with sodic sites. But more typically, uh, we'd see an intermingling of these habitats. So this would be fairly typical of the environments we're working in. You have grassland, you have trees present, and shrubs as well. So we're looking at, we already had field data from back in 2002. To look at change over time, we need to collect more data. 
So we revisited the study area in July 2014. We had a 285 survey locations that were visited previously. We visited 188 of these again um, in 2014, including revisits to 66 of these locations. And the little map here shows the spread of points across the Southern Kruger National Park. So we had reasonable geographical coverage of these points, but with a particular focus on the areas for which we had the, the high resolution imagery. And these survey locations, other than the ones that were revisits to existing sites, they were selected to try to be representative of the range of vegetation types and land cover types that are present across the study area. At each of these locations, we recorded the land cover types present. We took reference cardinal photos, north, south, east, and west, and also did some vegetation surveys at some sites as well. And we also see some of the local wildlife did take an interest in, in our field work there. So all this data, we used it to then inform our remote sensing analysis. Once look at change over time, now in this instance, sentinel data couldn't go, it wasn't available, it's fairly new. So we couldn't, it wasn't available back in 2002. So instead, our first protocol was to use Landsat imagery. So we acquired a Landsat image from 2002, an ETM image, an OLI image from July 2014, and we used these to generate um, two land cover classifications. So because of the fairly broad um, spectral or spatial resolution of 30 metres of Landsat, we couldn't identify individual trees or individual patches of shrub. So what we instead had to do is characterise the grassland to woodland gradient uh, within the savannas of fairly broad thematic classes. So we used four classes here, continuous grassland, discontinuous grassland, open and closed woodland. And the criteria for being classified as these is based on the level of woody canopy cover. So continuous grassland is not 25% canopy cover um, and so on, up to closed woodland, which is 75 to 100% canopy cover. So when we looked at the change between these two dates, we've seen that closed woodland had increased by 7.4%. Equally open woodland had increased by 1.6%. So those thematic classes that had greater tree on woody cover were increasing consistent with what was being reported with woody encroachment. Equally, the more open grassy classes had, had reduced in coverage. So discontinuous grassland had reduced by almost 6%, continuous grassland by almost 2%. So this was great. We could see in our satellite imagery the woody encroachment that was being reported on the ground. The problem we had with this is we couldn't see which, of, which broad vegetation classes were responsible for this vegetation change, whether it be trees or whether it be shrubs. So instead, we went back to the very high resolution imagery that we had from the earlier study period, the quick bird and Agnos images. We retasked more high resolution imagery from Worldview 2 and Agnos again, and we repeated this, um, the land cover classification process. So here, because we could identify individual trees and shrubs given the increased spatial resolution, we used a slightly different classification schema, so we did classify trees and shrubs separately in also areas of grassland. Now, we did notice immediately the classification accuracies were much higher because of the spatial, improved spatial resolution. But when we were looking at the actual <coughs> vectors of change, surprisingly, we noticed that the tree cover had actually reduced by 13.5%. So this wasn't what we expected to see. We expected to see this going up. Conversely, shrubs had increased by a larger amount, by 18.1%. So even though we're seeing a reduction in trees, which we think is due to elephant herbivory. The increase in shrubs was overriding this, and this was the overall increase in woody cover that we're seeing um, in the Landsat results. So this was great. Not only could we see uh, woody encroachment happening, we could also tell that this was coming from shrub inundation rather than trees. <clears throat> but there were some problems with this. So we established that we, we can monitor woody encroachment, Landsat can do this, but can't differentiate between trees and scrubs. There is a big difficulty using VHR classification and the cost, certainly over broad areas, is prohibitively expensive. As with all optical systems, it's limited by cloud, certainly in some African savannah environments, and also seasonality, which I've not really touched on. So the wet and dry season landscape characteristics look very different because of the vegetation flushes, and this can be reflected in classification accuracies. So the solution to these was the Sentinel satellites. This is where we looked, looked to, to resolve these issues. So instead of looking to generate these land cover classifications based on single light optical imagery, 
we instead wanted to use time series um, SAR data to look at the differences in radar batch data and they change throughout the year due to vegetation phenology and use this in combination with Sentinel-2 optical imagery. So in terms of the data, we acquired um, Sentinel-1 SAR data for 32 dates uh, between the 20th of March 2015 6 June 2016, so this was a full time series of Sentinel-1 data that was available to us at the time. We used both VV and VH polarizations, and we also acquired a Sentinel-2 image uh, for the dry season for the 24th of May, um, and used, we didn't use all the spatial bands for this, we disregarded the 60 meter bands, uh, but retained all the other 20, 10 and 20 meter resolution bands. So for the SAR data, we did some pre-processing steps, so calibration, terrain correction, and spatial subsetting to our area of interest. We then took all the 64 SAR bands and the Sentinel-2 bands that were retained, stacked these into a single data file. And we then classified this using our field data, using a random forest classifier, using our software. And then performed um, accuracy assessment on our results using the out-of-bag method which random forest offers. Um, and these, this is the result that we came up with. And what we're surprised to see is the very high accuracy assessment. This was far higher than we anticipated, but obviously we're very happy with it. So this is coming in uh, over 95% accurate, which is higher than we're seeing from the VHR imagery and also from the Landsat imagery. But the advantage this has is that we can differentiate between areas of trees and shrubs, and this is what we wanted to be able to do. So this, um, this offers a number of advantages over previous systems um, also being available free. It's unaffected by cloud cover um, with, because our data can penetrate that. So it overcomes many of the issues we had. So although we can't do repeat land cover classifications because we only have a short time period of data available, we've established we can monitor woody encroachment through remote sensing and also going forward that we can use Sentinel-2 data to map this more accurately. So conclusions, as just touched on, uh, we can monitor woody encroachment through remote sensing. Uh, we've illustrated the potential of sentinel data to not only map this, but shrub encroachment. We can use time series SAR data and sentinel-2 data in combination to do this at higher accuracy levels than we can do using just optical imagery. The sentinel data overcomes some of the previous limitations that we're seeing in terms of spatial resolution, certainly compared to Landsat. Um, cost because it's free, cloud cover limitations because SAR can penetrate cloud, and also the effects of seasonality because we're using data from, from the whole year. And the ongoing uh, Sentinel programs ensures that there will be future data collected, um, and this will allow these methods to be applied long term for long term monitoring. And it also allows uh, land managers in a more practical sense to better inform their understanding of the changes that are occurring and the potential ecological consequences of the vegetation structural changes uh, for impacts on areas and particular species in question. Um, so that was just a brief overview. If you want any more details, then do come and speak to me um, later. But thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Questions? Thank you. Hi, uh, that was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I was really slightly surprised by your result of high uh, accuracy of discrimination between tree and shrub because typically C band SAR has been not, not so good at doing that. Um, and I was wondering if you had insight as to why your method produces a good discrimination, whether it's because of the combination with the optical or whether it's because of the structural complexity on the ground? Well, we did also, uh, I've not presented it here just because I missed it for time limitations, but we did also do the uh, classifications just using the SAR data, so not with the Sentinel-2 data. And the accuracy assessments then came back about 85%, so lower um, than when Sentinel-2 data was included. But we did, did see over-representation of woodland habitats. So, um, you know, 85% for classifications, you know, it's not bad. But certainly it does seem in this location, mapping these thematic classes that we picked, that we do also um, have added benefits from spectral information that's coming from Sentinel-2 that, that boosted that, that classification accuracy up. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, have you checked or looked into the value of intensity analysis and how that could offer some kind of insight into woody, woody vegetation encroachment whereby you look at uh, gains and loss in pixel states and what pixel states are changing to what and what pixel are losing to what. So instead of this tree shrub, grassland uh, dynamics taking place in this study area. We have looked at the change vectors using the um, Landsat and VHR data. So we noticed there that the change to shrub was actually dual directional. So grassland was converting to shrub and also areas that were previously tree were converting to shrub, which seems an unusual pattern. But we think what's happening is um, the increase in elephant populations in this area are coming knocking down the trees for food which is why we've seen the tree loss. And those areas subsequent to those trees being knocked down um, are then being inundated by shrub. So we're having a, a dual directional increase in shrub. So we, we have touched on that, yes. We do have to press on, but I've already said no to a question from you once, so I'll... Thanks. Um, I was just wondering um, whether you looked at using seasonal data from Sentinel-2 by itself. Not as of yet, no. Um, one of the challenges we found when we were working with the optical data was that cloud cover um, in some areas. So that's really why we turned to the SAR data, um, look at the phenology to overcome that. Now, we, we kind of added on a um, Sentinel-2 dry season image, which worked well for us, but we haven't looked at monitoring phenology just using Sentinel-2. I feel we may struggle knowing that site and the cloud cover problems we have there. Um, but, you know, it's certainly something that we, that we could consider move further down the line. Okay, thank you very much. We better press on. So, thank you, Chris. And our penultimate speaker is Mark Danson, Professor of Remote Sensing uh, from the University of Salford. And Mark's going to talk to us about a project of mapping fuel moisture dynamics from Sentinel-2 data. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, so this talk really relates to research we've been doing at Salford over, I guess, the last five or six years. Um, and I'll show you some examples and outputs of some of that research. But most of the Sentinel-2 uh, work has been done by the middle author here, that's Abdul Basak Bardi, um, as part of his PhD research. Um, and the third author is Richard Armitage, who's my colleague at Salford University. What we're really interested in doing is trying to see if we can actually, actually use satellite data to um, inform fire risk assessment in upland areas in the UK. Um, and about uh, four or five years ago, we did some work with airborne hyperspectral imagery flown by the Natural Environment Research Council over our test site in, in the Derbyshire Peak District um, um, on Burbage Moor. So the, the funny coloured picture on the left-hand side shows two dates from our airborne hyperspectral imaging system. And the colours re relate to the amount of moisture uh, in the vegetation. So the blue areas relate to areas with um, a fuel moisture content, as, as it's called, of about 150%. So that says the weight of the water is 50% more than the weight of the, the dry matter. Um, and the red areas are, are the uh, areas with lower fuel moisture content. And the weird thing in this environment, Kaluna or Heather Moorland, is that the, the vegetation is actually drier in May uh, than it is in July. And that's, uh, that's another story. The, the key thing uh, is this result down here. This shows the uh, estimated fuel moisture content for a, a series of plots that you can see here with data at 1.5 metre resolution. And the results of this work... <coughs> oops. The result of this work... Press the right button. Is that we seem to be able to estimate fuel moisture in Kaluna moorlands with a, an accuracy of about 10%, which is probably uh, good enough for many of the uh, fuel models that we want to, to um, populate. 
So what we want to do is try and apply the same thing at landscape scale using satellite data, and, and there are a number of challenges. The first challenge is whether we have a physical relationship between a vegetation index and the thing that we're trying to measure. And what this plot here shows is uh, a simulation of the relationship between the normalised difference water index, which is just this ratio up here, which I've shown you in terms of the Sentinel 2A optical bands, and the thing that we're trying to measure, which is fuel moisture content, over the sort of range that we'd expect to see in upland environments? And the answer is no, isn't it, really? Because we've simulated um, a very large number of, of canopies here using um, um, a radiative transfer model. And there's no relationship between the vegetation index and fuel moisture content. However, if you see on the bottom line, this simulation represents um, canopies with a leaf air index between 0.1 and 5. And if we only look at canopies with a narrow range of leaf air index, then it looks like we stand half a chance of, of being able to extract useful information. So most of the variability that you see in the simulations here are due to differences in leaf air index. And when we're trying to detect changes in moisture content in a heather canopy, we can pretty much assume that the changes in moisture content over a few, uh, changes in leaf air index rather, over a few weeks or a few months is going to be very small. The next challenge is cloud cover. And again, a few years ago, uh, we published a paper showing the cloud cover frequency for the UK. So the, the coloured uh, map of the U UK on the left shows the likelihood of seeing the ground with a morning overpass from a satellite in the UK at one kilometre resolution. So the sunniest parts of the UK down, down south here have a probability of seeing a, a given one kilometre patch of about 25 to 30%. Up in Scotland, it's 3 to 5 or 6%, something like that. And for our test side, it's 15%. So we can do a back-of-the-envelope calculation now and say that with 15% probability of seeing the surface, um, we're going to probably uh, only see it 50 days a year, so once a week. If we convolve that with a repeat cycle of 10 days, <clears throat> then we're only going to get 5 Sentinel-2 a images per year, so clearly we're still short of, of data. The other challenge is to do with the spectral properties of the sensor, <clears throat> and one neat thing is that the Landsat operational land imager has very, very similar spectral channel channels to the Sentinel 2A. And so what I'm going to show you now is a combination of using data from these two satellite sensors at, at our field site. So this is just an example of the, the sort of data that we're, we're now able to use. And one of, the, uh, one of the things we've heard several times is about this 10-day repeat cycle for Sentinel-2A. Well, actually, depending on where you are, that's not true. Um, because what you can see in this image here on the left-hand side is a westerly pass over the north of England. And then here on the 6th of June, an easterly pass over the United Kingdom. And this yellow box shows the area of overlap from Sentinel 2A uh, in this part of the country. And clearly, there is an, another area of overlap on the, um, you know, the western side of this image as well. The Landsat optical land images have got the same characteristics of most of the previous Landsat uh, data. It's a smaller imaging area, but our test site represented by the red blob, just sits straight in the middle of the uh, Landsat 8 image. So, so we, we, um, uh, we're in a good position. There are some differences uh, in spatial resolution. And previously, when we tried to use Landsat um, thematic mapper or, or ETM data, the 30 meter resolution data just hasn't been quite fine enough to detect these very, very small plots that we're interested in in, in areas of uh, managed Kaluna um, moorland. So um, we went out and collected some data and this shows uh, Abdul Bassett 
uh, collecting data at one of our plots. So we've marked on here, actually, with a tape measure, one um, 20 meter uh, pixel. And we visited five different plots across this area. It's only an area of about three or four kilometers squared. Uh, a number of times so far during, during this year. So we started in April here. Uh, and this is the fuel moisture content measured at a number of uh, sites within these plots at, um, I don't know, a dozen dates or so, and we're still continuing through time here. And these are the data sets that we've got to work with. So the red dots here, uh, red triangles rather, are the, the Sentinel-2A data. The blue triangles, the Landsat-8 operational land imager data. Um, and you can see there are some, some big gaps, not surprisingly, given the back of the envelope calculation that I did with you um, um, just before. Nevertheless, we, uh, we're now in a position to um, look at the relationship between um, a vegetation index and fuel moisture content for these, for these plots. So this is the uh, result, hot off the press. And um, all we've done is just plotted the relationship between fuel moisture and normalised difference water index, just as you saw with the airborne hyperspectral image data. So the, um, the shaded area is not a, a confidence interval. That's our 10% error band that we were aiming for with the uh, hyperspectral data. So you can see there's a reasonable correlation, probably not one that we'd want to uh, use for operational mapping. Um, quite a lot of scatter. Um, more than half the points fall within our 10% uh, estimation band, but there are some um, fairly significant outliers, which are probably caused by um, our cross-calibration um, approach, which we use to circumnavigate the problem of atmospheric correction. So rather than atmospherically correct every image independently, we cross-calibrate every image to common, uh, a common reflectance image. So... We've got a bit more work to do. There's probably some issues here to do with uh, view angle, BRDF corrections, uh, differences in spatial resolution, uh, problems of co-locating pixels and sampling points. But um, it looks like we're, we're, we're on the way. So uh, this diagram here you've seen before. This was our um, relationship, theoretical relationship from the ProSale model. Um, and what I've done now is put this regression line on the model, and you can see we've got a, something funny going on here. So I uh, only, only did this a couple of days ago. Don't really know what the problem here is, but, but this red line here, the regression line, should be falling somewhere in here. And this is almost certainly to do with uh, not accounting properly for the variation in soil background um, that we see um, throughout the year in, in uh, these sort of plots. So, in conclusion, um, what, what I've shown you, uh, I'll try to show, is the first demonstra uh, demonstration of landscape, landscape scale estimation of fuel moisture content from satellite data in the cloudy UK. Um, we're able to integrate Sentinel 2A data with Landsat uh, operational land imager um, as long as we can do an accurate cross calibration. The, the Sentinel toolbox atmospheric correction just doesn't, doesn't work well enough for us to do this. With 15% cloud cover frequency um, and weekly image acquisition, um, we, we have a bit of a, a problem um, because to get weekly image acquisition back of the envelope tells us we need to try and acquire data every day. So how close are we getting to, to daily uh, image attempts well, with Sentinel 2B here, this is, uh, this is the, um, the box of tricks on the left-hand side just before it was shipped out. Uh, due March 17, we'll have two Sentinel, uh, Sentinel 2 satellites. And at our sort of higher latitudes, uh, and with the overlap that I showed you before, we'll get two to three uh, day repeat imaging of, of test sites in the northwest of England. If we throw in some um, Landsat 8 data, then we might get to something like two-day uh, repeat cycles. So that means probably two images a month at, at best. And so um, the title of this uh, session was something about uh, the potential of Sentinel for ecological applications. Well, I've shown you the potential here. 
um, what I would say is we're still short of two more Sentinel optical satellites. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions from the mic? Katie. The leaf area index of two that you used, is mm. that equivalent to a certain age class of Kaluna? Yeah, it's very difficult to measure the leaf area index of Kaluna. We've tried to do it many times. You know, the leaves are um, millimetres long, literally. Um, we've done experiments before that show that for the managed state that you see in... Uh, this area is mowed rather than burnt uh, in rotation. And for those managed areas, there's actually not a great deal of difference in the leaf air index. You know, the, the older stands tend to be very leggy, um, but have a relatively, you know, constant leaf air index compared to the, to the new uh, regrowth stands. So probably not much different. But if anybody's ever measured it, do let me know, and I'll put some proper numbers in the, in the model. Go here first. Thank you very much. Uh, the result that you found uh, that is uh, drier in May, do you actually have any explanation for it? Yeah, it's just a phenological characteristic of Kaluna. So during the winter, it, 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 it dries out and desiccates, and the green-up period is, is um, in late spring. So in late spring, you get greening of the canopy and then flowering into August and September when it looks classically purple. Um, but the, the, the dry characteristics is, is, is winter desiccation of the, of the foliage, which means actually the fire risk is higher um, in spring and winter than it is in the summer, but the soils are much wetter in the, in the spring, so that partly mitigates the problem. A nice result you got from your hyperspectral work at the start where it was close correlation with the uh, moisture content. Was that through um, machine learning or some physical basis? No, no, that was simply using the, the same water index that I, I showed oh, you before, okay. yeah, so just purely empirical. Yeah, we did all sorts of stuff on, you know, um, high, high spectral resolution indices and uh, um, various different um, high spectral resolution indices, and they, they didn't pr produce any stronger correlation than the broadband indices. Great. OK, thank you very much. Again, we better press on. So thank you, Mark. And on to our final talk. We've got all the academics, all the universities out of the way, so it's over to CEH. Now also pseudo-academic, I suppose. But it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Dan uh, Morton here, who's going to wrap up by talking about uh, a lovely title, given the, the, uh, the theme of the session, Habitat Sentinels, Monitoring UK Broad habitats, please. Thanks, Paul. So if any of you are watching the programme, you'll see that the title's changed. That's because uh, I didn't submit the abstract. I can't even claim to have done much of the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, the work was largely done by Claire Rowland and Lewis uh, Carrasco, who's in the audience here. Um, so I hope I can do it justice, Lewis. Um, so I'm talking about Habitat Sentinels, monitoring UK broad habitats. So I changed the word in the original title, from mapping to monitoring, because that's really what I'm aiming to get towards as, as we go forward. Mapping gives you a snapshot of the, of the land surface at any point in time, but if we want to monitor, we have to be consistent in the way that we gather that snapshot so that we can compare different points in time to begin to detect change. Um, next slide. So, so, contents of this talk, um, First of all, I'm going to give you a quick history lesson um, about the, 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 the UK land cover map series and uh, specifically talk about LCM 2015, which is a, a new product that was about to be released in the next few months, and the techniques that we developed in that, how we'll adapt those to, to exploit this plethora of data that's becoming available from the, from the Sentinel satellites. And I'm going to be talking about Sentinel 1 and 2 and what they offer for UK um, habitat mapping. And then I'm going to describe a couple of experiments where we look at the impact of the spatial resolution of, uh, of Sentinel on the classification results. Previously, we've, we've used Landsat. With Sentinel-2, the, um, the, the, the optical bands come in 10, 20, and 60-meter resolution. So which resolution do we use to describe the land surface? 
And then we're going to look at uh, the interaction of Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and image classification results, and some preliminary results. And these are preliminary, preliminary results. We're really just uh, getting started on this, and we've really barely scratched the surface. So um, CEH, the organization I work for, has a long history of, of, of uh, broad habitat mapping or land cover mapping, so a quarter of a century now. So the first land cover map produced by CEH was in 1990. Another product was produced in 2000, 2007, and any, any time soon there'll be another um, product, LCM 2015, which incidentally, before anyone asks at the end, is based upon Landsat 8 data because the uh, Sentinel weren't available when we began this work. Um, but the thing, oh, I forgot to put that one in. So why is land cover map important? Um, well, these, these products produced by CEH are widely used by academia, commercial users, governments, NGOs. They're useful for natural capital assessment, ecosystem service assessments, um, for designing of natural experiments, wide range of recent users. CEH has um, um, an environmental data center where we provide lots of uh, data sets online to the research community. And uh, the LCM series of products um, exceed the downloads of all of their data sets by, by uh, combined by, by over an order of magnitude. And we have many, many users and many, many downloads over the years. So they're important data sets. And we're working at how the Sentinel satellites can, can allow us to produce these data more frequently and more accurately. So mapping vs monitoring. So monitoring is really about change detection. One of the problems with the previous land cover maps is that they, they, they were mainly developed for, for looking at stock and extent. And, and, and naturally, in the course of, uh, of, of developing techniques, techniques have changed. So the first land cover map was produced in 1990. It was an, it was an incredible um, product for its time. But since then, methods have changed and improved. So each time we've produced a land cover map, we've allowed the, that evolution of methods to, to, to be used to produce a new product. But then when it comes to start thinking about change and comparing methodology rather than real change on the ground. So, so what we want to do going forward is we want to be consistent in derivation um, in the way that we derive the land cover. Um, so we need good. We need consistent data type, data timing, data methods, and we need to be consistent in the, the way that we describe the, the spatial and thematic uh, um, elements of the land cover. Um, we need more, we need frequency images, and good monitoring needs requires high accuracy. So I'm hoping that the Sentinel data will allow us to, to make uh, progress on each of these. So just to, to give you a problem, this, uh, this is a consequence of Mark's back of the envelope calculation. This is an image mosaic that we use for the production of uh, LCM 2007. Um, I think there was about 70 composite images produced, used to, to, to generate the products. Um, and we had to scramble images from various sensors at different points in time to get a complete coverage of the UK. So we're talking about LCM 2007, but it's actually LCM 2005 to 2008, because that's the range of uh, images that we needed to scramble together to produce that. But it's not just enough to get an image at one point in time, so this is a field of winter wheat. Um, but we also need to capture the, 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 the seasonal changes in those landscapes to discriminate, for instance, winter wheat from grassland. Um, we, need, we need images at multiple points in, in the growing season. So it's not just enough to get a complete coverage of the UK. You need several coverages of the UK in order to classify these images and make sense of it. So I'm going to talk about the first experiment. Um, so Sentinel-2 has bands at 10 and 20 meter meters. For accurate classification, should we resample the bands, all the bands to 10 meters, or should we resample them all to 20 meters? And then experiment two, um, radar. The good thing about radar, everybody said that it's relatively unaffected by weather. Um, so each time the radar image comes, the, the, the radar satellite comes over, we can get a complete, we can get a cloud-free view of the ground. Um, uh, um, yeah, so we're then, it gives us an opportunity to develop a, a multi-date time series that isn't really possible within one, one, what, with one year from the, the Sentinel-2 data. Um, let's press on. So the Sentinel-1 data, what we've done is we've gathered 10 images over the growing season, over, over a period of 24 days um, from the 
3rd of March 2016 to October um, 2016. Some processing steps of calibration, taking out the um, and speckle filtering, a um, bit of terrain correction. And what we did with these, we averaged over land parcels to, uh, that, to some extent that helps remove some of the, 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 the noise that you get within a radar image. But actually, I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but for, the, for this uh, analysis we did. Um, this gives you an example of a, a Sentinel-1 image. Um, you don't get the same range of uh, you don't get the same detail as you would do for an optical image because you're only really getting perhaps HH and HV polarization images, so you get a grayscale image. The good thing is you get them regardless of, of weather conditions. Um, but what you can do is you can combine the images from multiple points in the growing season, so this is just three points in time, but we're actually, for the analysis I'm going to talk about, we have ten points in time. And if you start sticking those different... Uh, grayscale images at different points in time in the, in the, in the color guns of a, of a of EDU, you, you start to see discrimination between different land cover types. Now what we want to find out is whether that discrimination is actually useful and can help us differentiate land cover. So this is an area around Sheffield. You can clearly see the, the conurbation, which is the bright area, um, Howden Reservoir and uh, Lady Bell Reservoir over to the left of the scene. And then as you get to the east of the Pennines, you start to see the sort of arable fabric um, developing. So we, we chose this because it had a, a wide range of land cover types. Um, so this is just the, the giving you a, an idea of the, the rest of the scene that we were working with. Uh, Sentinel-2 data, so we got three images, 29th of December from last year, 20th of April from, from this year, and 6th of June from this year. Ten vans were available at 10 or 20 meter resolution. Um, the problem with, with optical data, and it's still the biggest hurdle to, to land cover mapping, is the pre-processing steps that you need to do to so the atmospheric correction, in particular the cloud masking. Then once you've done the cloud masking and, and so forth, you've got to create an image mosaic, which can be quite a challenge in a cloudy country like the UK. So the Sentinel-2 data, three images, different points in the year. So now I'll talk about the classification. So the classification methods that we developed were um, for the production of LCM 2015. We've used exactly the same classification algorithms for both the Sentinel-1 and the Sentinel-2 data. So eventually, essentially, it just creates a layer stack of the, uh, of in, in the case of the, the radar, the backscatter, or in the, um, in the case of the, the, the Sentinel-2 data, the optical data, the, the, the different bands, put them in a layer stack. Once you've prepared the data, and then you classify the data. So the classification algorithm that we're using is, is a random forest algorithm. And because we have a rich history of uh, a land cover products, instead of going out in the field and making lots of observations, we use a learning method that we present it to the classifier, the, the, the historical series of land cover maps. And from those, it harvests information about the, the land cover, looks for stable areas of land cover, and uses those data to classify the, the satellite image. Um, the good thing about this new technique is it's a reduction of manual inputs. I mean, it's a completely automated process to select the training areas. It's much faster, increased speed and efficiency, which can lead in the future to more frequent LCMs. Um, so far, the, the, the iteration cycle has been about 10 years. We can probably reduce that to three or even less with the new techniques. And it also raises the, 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 the opportunity to, to reclassify some of the old satellite images using the same the, the, the same training d data sets and the same algorithms so we can start to look at what might have changed between 1990, 2000, 2007, 2015 and so forth. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so very quickly. So, so what we do when we classify an image, we summarize it by, um, the, I mean, uh, the optical image, we classify the pixels and then we summarize them by overlaying a parcel structure on top of that. The parcel structure is being derived from Ordnance Survey Master Map. And we can describe the, the land cover um, as, as a frequency distribution, but the nominal land cover type is the most frequent uh, pixel. So in this case, this, uh, um, the land, land cover is described as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as heather. Um, so we did an analysis, what's the, the impact of 20 or 20 meters? Um, so the, the red polygons on there show the, 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 poly, the, the land parcels that have changed from changing the resolution from 10 to 20 meters. So overall, we don't really get much by increasing the spatial resolution using the spatial framework that we have already. 
less than 5% of change, I would guess. And most of the changes that are occurring are mainly in the small habitats, um, small areas of habitats like fen, um, which typically occupy sort of small areas and also um, polygons that are actually quite small and narrow. So overall, not much change at all. So we probably don't get a great deal from changing the spatial resolution of the data. Um, I'll just summarize that again as I'm running short of time. So mainly just the small polygons have changed and the thin polygons tend to change. And then we've also done another analysis of looking at classification of the Sentinel-2 data only. Um, the Sentinel-2 data at 20 meters, 10 meters, Sentinel-1 and 2, so combining all the radar bands with the optical bands and then Sentinel-1 only. And I think what's quite interesting here is that the Sentinel-1 classification, um, without any optical data in at all, picks out all the land cover classes that we're able to get from the optical data. Um, zoom in a little bit. So the, if, if you look there, I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost indifferentiable from, from uh, the Sentinel-2. The, the reason why it's a little bit less granular is because we, we did a per parcel filter on the Sentinel-1 data, so it looks at some of the granularity is taken out. But on the whole, it's, it's quite promising in that in a cloudy country like the UK, where, where clouds are a real problem, we can start to uh, exploit these new data sources that previously weren't available to, to describe the UK land surface in, in the same kind of detail that we've been doing previously. Um, but we can do it more frequently um, without the, the complex steps of uh, pre-processing and compiling a satellite mosaic of optical data. Um, so just draw a few conclusions. Further work's required. We've really only just scratched the surface. We get small gains in thematic resolution by increasing the spatial detail of the, from 20 to 10 meters, but not a great deal. Accurate broad habitat classification may now be possible with radar alone. We need to look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, by allowing more frequent uh, updates and consistent data, um, we can now get in close to a close to a broad habitat monitoring system and more frequent uh, um, updates of the data. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, any questions? Can I, uh, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have a problem. Um, you can pass the classification results of 10 meters and 20 meters. So what you have done to uh, up, uh, to upsampling and uh, to, uh, to resemble the 20 meters to 10 meters? Sorry, I didn't quite understand uh, the question. Yeah, um, there, are, there are 10 bands uh, of around uh, 10 meters and 20 meters. Yeah, you have done something to... So, so, so the data have been resampled to 20 from, so they're all, uh, all, the, all the variants from the central two image mm. were put in. Drawing all that information into the, into the uh, random forest algorithm and classifying it using training data that's been harvested from the, the, the time series of land cover maps. So it means uh, you only use uh, four ten, 10 meters bands? Uh, we use all the bands, we just resampled them all to the same sort um, of I think when you resample the uh, 20 meters to 10 meters, there should be some smooth effects. So that means uh, it may not be very good to uh, classification of some special details because that's most effects in the resembling process. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's just a comment. Okay, well, well we, I mean, we, we, we found that the classifications were, were coming out reasonably well by, mm. by both methods of you know, getting, I, I don't know what the accuracy was because I haven't looked at the, um, the, the those in detail, but mm. it's, it's, it's not a significant problem. Okay, thank you. Any final questions? Okay, two more quickly. Two more. Just a, a general question or, or, or comment. Um, it, it seems surprising that it's surprising that SAR data can be used for land cover classification. How, how is it you've only just discovered this? Well, <laughs> one of the projects that I've been involved in recently was looking into producing a crop map from, from Central One data. And I actually found that by constructing, um, I mean, you know that the, the um, radar data is very sensitive to canopy architecture. So when vegetation grows, the background changes throughout the season. So 
what you actually do when you look at the potential wine base is you capture in structural chronology throughout the growing season. And we were able to produce a crop map down to a high level of accuracy in the UK using Sardex's called the Wine Hunt Using uh, uh, Landfill Mapping. And uh, slightly different technique. Sardex has been unavailable at that same temporal frequency and uh, over the UK territory and it would have just been too costly to gather 10 complete coverages of the UK through a certain period of the growing season and to process that. So, so, so what's happened is, is that people have talked about Sentinels being a game changer, well this is the changing of the game, you know, the data is becoming available that allowing this kind of innovation that just hasn't been possible before. Last quick question, yeah. I would be interested, what is your experience regarding the geo-referencing between the, the two systems? Uh, as I know from the Sentinel-2, they did really a very good job in uh, uh, co-registration within the Sentinel-2. Um, but what about your experience between, I mean, as you're on a pixel level, mm. and at 10 by 10 meters, so every mislocation of uh, well, five meters? So I can't comment much on it. Starts with talk to so most of the work that's done by other people. But I mean, ultimately, when we're producing the final products, we're summarizing pixel classification using a land parser. So slight variations in the geo registration don't really affect the, 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 the effect of classification result because um, you know, vectors in, in the spatial environment are typically half a hectare or greater. So the, the, the displacement. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Great, I was about to ask you to put the, the slide back up and you've done it already, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm exhausted, I don't know about you, these two hour sessions are a real slog, so well done for being here and for staying through this, uh, this, the duration of the session. The Sentinels really are offering an incredible temporal uh, data set free for us to use and we've seen some good technical work today which kind of points towards likely ecolo ecological applications. Um, so we do hope that we can get these communities together, earth observation and ecology, to do this. Now for those of you that aren't completely exhausted and I apologise for keeping you from the refreshments for an extra 10 or 15 minutes, we are providing more refreshments later on uh, at 8 o'clock after uh, we have an evening lecture. So after the poster sessions now, there's a series of different events going on at seven o'clock. And we're holding, we're hosting the Remote Setting and Photogrammetry Society annual lecture in Conversazioni. A reminder to those here at the start, but information for those that have come in midway through the session. Given by Natalie Petarelli um, on satellite remote sensing for conservation. So please do, if interested, come along and join us for that. In the meantime, thank you very much to the speakers and thank you for your attendance today. Thank you.